Hey, welcome everyone to week eight. We will be doing a dual lecture today. I want to point out that this is part of the course where we are shifting into more of a marketing angle. So last week we talked about leads and referral building, which was definitely a marketing angle. And if you look at the course plan, you'd see that in week seven, we, we did have that shift where I have this course sort of divided into modules, not FOL modules, but actual modules here. And if you go down to week seven, you'll see we shifted into marketing. I really didn't mention that enough last week, um, but that is the case that we're kind of having a course shift. There'll be no more purchase textbooks, but there'll be resources in FOL, possibly. Not every single week, but maybe a little bit. And you can see here sessions for last week were marketing related. Session eight, marketing related. That's what we're in now. And that goes through uh, week 11 or up to week 11. Okay, so we are in week eight now, and we're going to be dealing with um, traditional marketing and the power of or lack thereof in terms of traditional marketing. And then we'll move on to the power of quality writing, which in my face-to-face -face class, we'll have an exercise in class and I will do something similar with my online students and there will be a short video for that as well. So uh, you wanna be here Wednesday. Writing is extremely important for real estate. Um, it's just something that you're gonna want to participate in, even though it's not for credit. We don't have uh, credit uh, this particular week because we had the guest speaker last week and then we're gonna have another guest speaker next week for social media and a 5% assignment. So it's, it's more of just an exercise and it'll be a supplemental video for my online students. So let's get in right into week eight then. Um, we are now into our marketing portion of the course, as I mentioned. And we have a bit of shift here, which means that at this point, I'm assuming you have decided to get your license. So that's that's the assumption here when we go through the second half of the course is that you're going to get your license and these are the things you wanna think about. Don't go get your license and run out and print a bunch of signs and go crazy and start spending money on print ads and putting your name in every magazine with a big picture of your face. It is a complete waste of money and I'm going to explain why today. And I've tried a little bit of everything, so I've been there. Right, I've been there, I've done that for 10 years. So, and I, it's only gravitating more toward the type of stuff I'm gonna be talking about in this lecture, okay? So you've decided to become a realtor. We're gonna talk about the power, or as I commented, the lack thereof, when it comes to traditional or conventional marketing mediums. Because people who have been in the business for a long time, always assumed that those traditional mediums they were using were working. They never really knew otherwise until they started doing other things that, that, that was actually working and they realized the other ones weren't giving a return. It's very hard to track return with traditional marketing mediums. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the ones you would wanna bother with as not just a new salesperson in real estate, but a tenured person in real estate because I've bothered with them all and now I'm at the point where I just don't even touch some of these. Okay, so we're gonna get into that one too, that as well, the ones to avoid. Okay, so before we do, I'm assuming you have taken a marketing course just in case, what is marketing, okay? And I'm gonna add a little bit to this definition because we are talking about marketing in the context of a commission sales career. Commission sales career means there's gonna be a little more going on than just the action of promoting and selling products and services, including market research and advertising, that doesn't mention people in there at all. We all know that people are part of the four Ps, but it just doesn't even mention them in the definition. That's the dictionary definition of marketing, which I do not like, okay? I don't like, and I'm not gonna probably quiz you on that. You guys have to take a marketing course, we, we know this, so. But the big difference between a very basic and stripped down definition of marketing like this compared to the definition of marketing that you're going to have in a sales commission career is relationships, which I will actually, um, I will actually add into that slide. What about relationships, okay? Because relationship marketing is huge. And for some reason, even though that's part of marketing as far as I'm concerned on any level, it's not included in the larger definition, okay? Which kind of bothers me. Um, so I'll put that in there and highlight it in, I don't know, 
we'll make it in blue or something. I don't want it to be negative or anything. Red, I guess, is good. Uh, because we need to remember that. And I knew I was going to talk about that, but at this point, I think it's even more important to have it right in the slide. What about relationships? And what I mean by that, and that'll be in your slides, face-to-face -face students, when I post them. What about relationships? I'm talking about the fact that in a sales commission career, you aren't going to make any money without clients or customers. Okay, you're just not. You're not just going to go out and sell real estate to nobody. So there has to be an aspect in your marketing plan that has to do with your connection with people. And then, of course, tied in with this definition, we have the four Ps. Okay, so the four Ps of marketing would be, what are they again? Yeah, in, in any in place, in any particular order, in any particular order, depends on the industry or in what order you probably prioritize them as, but in any particular order. Okay, so there are many, many, many infographics on the four Ps. Uh, I kind of like this one because it was very simple. Here are the four Ps, okay? Your product would be real property. And we've defined real estate at the beginning of the course and all those versions of real estate. That would be your product, okay? They list things like functionality, brand, packaging, services. I would think that in your position, I would think, I know this, in your position as a licensed salesperson in real estate, you don't just have the services. You're also dealing with the tangi tangible product of real property. So you're, you're being affected by both, where you look at this sometimes in, in terms of the product and you say, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a real estate person, I'm a realtor, so it's a service, but you're selling something that's tangible, so it's a product. So uh, it's important to understand that everyone is different. When you get into that P, things are gonna be very diverse and it's always gonna be changing and you have commercial versus residential, and that's your product, plus your services are your product. You're trying to pitch your services to people that are interested in selling their properties. They've already established that they're going to sell your house. The product is fixed in that, in that situation. Okay, you're just trying to get their listing. When you go to approach someone that you know or heard was interested in buying, the product is not fixed. Okay, so that's a big deal that the product is fixed and one or the other. We're gonna talk about that more in a second. Then you have price, okay, and of course, I love that this relates directly to real estate. Everybody knows that the listing price they put on a piece of real estate isn't always the price. And there's a lot of customer service involved on both ends to try and keep that as high or get that as low as you can, depending on who you're representing. Okay, bundling stuff, credit terms, That's some of that applies to real estate, but these are good examples in general to make sure that you remember what the four Ps are. We're gonna talk a lot about promotion today. Okay, so we're focusing on this P. Last week, what were we talking about? Okay, people. Okay, I said at the beginning of this video that I don't like that nobody ever mentions people when they talk about the four Ps, because that's not in the four Ps. That is the fifth P, okay? And we'll talk lots about that in week nine. The reason traditional mediums do not work as well as digital marketing is because of the lack of engagement with people, as I like to call it, the fifth P. Okay, so we're definitely gonna talk about the fifth P, and it's gonna be something that connects directly to digital marketing. Okay, so this came from an article, just a general article on marketing, okay, but they leave out the fifth P. So we'll get more into that next week. I'm gonna put the same slide up and you guys are gonna tell me what the fifth P is. You're not gonna forget. Okay, but promotion is what we're gonna discuss more today in the context of traditional marketing. And they have advertising, they have Salesforce, that's CRM stuff, publicity, sales promotion, and then the place, okay? So depending on the type of business you're in, you could be business to business, you could be store to customer, you guys are service to client, okay? You'd be like a lawyer, an accountant, something like that. You're a professional service provider in the business of real estate, but you also have the product. Not a lot of them have that tangible thing. An accountant is basically providing as the product the final bookkeeping package that this accountant has prepared for you. There's no house or anything like that. So you kind of cross over in terms of the fact that you, you have a service and a product and when it gets to the place nature of things, your place can be very spread out because of the nature of your business. If you're a B2B, 
you might just be operating out of a warehouse and shipping to people all over the country because of the way that market works and the connections you make. As a real estate salesperson, you're gonna be operating out of your local community, whatever that may be, small, large, we discussed a lot of that earlier in the course, and that would be the beginning of defining your place. And then from there, you would have to define niches in that market, smaller places you're gonna work with, whether you're gonna be downtown, do commercial, whether you're gonna do residential. So here, let's, let's look at some more uh, specific examples. So the Ontario Real Estate Association uh, has provided a pretty good article on the four Ps, okay? And they fail to mention too, the fifth P. I don't know how people keep missing this. Traditional marketers always talk about the fourth P. And promotion is supposed to take in the people element. I just believe as a digital marketer that it's a completely separate P and I'm not the only one. This is a commonplace thing that's written about all the time. And that, that will be next week's thing, but we're focusing today on traditional promotion. And when we look at the four Ps in the context of real estate specifically, here's what Aria is saying, okay? So product or service. So how do we approach a, cust a customer, potential client? Okay, how do we approach them and discuss with them what kind of stuff we're gonna do to make them work with us? Now this is very different depending on who we're approaching. Remember, in terms of this business, generally speaking, we're always gonna have two sides. Even if you're focusing primarily on commercial leasing, you would have the people who own the building that hired you to advertise their lease, and then you'd have the tenants that are coming that might be interested in leasing. Just like when you're focusing on uh, residential sales, you'll have the people who have houses that they want to sell, and then the people who will come looking at those houses who might be interested in buying. A lot of them may already have realtors, but you, you're always gonna have these two sides of the business, and that's a big deal, and that's why I liked their approach to the four Ps, okay? So for buyers, you wanna detail the advantage of working with your brokerage. Maybe there's something special going on with your brokerage. Maybe they're, they're all about the discounted commissions. At the end of the day, you can charge less, you'll just make less. Most brokerages allow you to charge whatever you want. Maybe like Sotheby's or some of these fancy brokerages don't. But um, types of services you offer, niches, so special things, like we, a lot of the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the course. But if a seller has approached you and you're doing like a listing presentation and they want you to come and show them what you would do if you listed their house, you want to show up with everything about their property. When you become a licensed realtor, you'll have access to special systems like the registry system and the board system that you're in, the real estate board you're in, that will show you what's been selling around that house and what it sold for and how many bedrooms and bathrooms those houses had, things like that, right? So you wanna show up with lots of data. Sellers love data. They already think their house is the best. And you know going in, most sellers are gonna want more than you're going to be able to get for it, 99% of the time. Unless you're in a seller's market where everything's going crazy over ask and you're just shocked and surprised by how much you get, which is more luck than anything. So information about the property, uh, amenities, ensuring information is accurate, obtaining knowledge about the neighborhood. That's just one side of things that you would do to show them what's going on with product or service, okay? Part of my services is my ability to generate these narrated storytelling type videos, especially in the shorter form format, but that would fall more into promotion. So establish a specific marketing plan that the seller's property based on the brokerage, broker salesperson, like something that you're gonna do that maybe makes you stand out, right? So these are very generic answers. You can see under promotion for buyers, outline institutional and targeted advertising, local and promotional strategies. How am I gonna find buyers, right? Well, oh, I'm gonna just look at all the marketing we're doing and see what I can do to find buyers. I mean, that's, it's very, very generic, okay? I'm, and this, this is, to me, the way Aria set this up, is the kind of things you consider if you were considering spending money on traditional print media or radio or something like that. Okay, they're not being specific enough. I'm not gonna say that these are the wrong answers. All oh, these answers are 100% accurate. Those are exactly the kind of things that fall into here. I might even put this on the quiz, right? I do quiz you directly from slides, you guys know that. Or the test, it's not gonna be a quiz the last one, it's gonna be a test, sorry. So looking at promotion, from a buyer's perspective, you'd, you'd wanna look at the advertising that maybe your brokerage is doing, and maybe you'd do something different. You'd want to look at the MLS and look at what people are looking at, basically, okay? But that's almost what buyers are looking for. 
Then, okay, on the other side, you have price and place. Okay, when they're buying, establish what commission will be charged to represent to sellers and buyers. Bundled services still, right away, Aria's off the bat going, commission, commission, you gotta be talking about commission no matter what. Okay, and I never talk about that with buyers. Now, I think it is important because you will have buyers, especially commercial buyers, where you will lock them into a buyer representation agreement where they might have to pay commission if they make you do a big pile of work for something they wanted to buy that wasn't listed and the seller is reluctant to sell, but you've convinced them to talk to you, which is a difficult process in itself. You gotta kind of work your way in the door and say, hey, would you be ever interested in selling? I got somebody really interested in your property. And then you end up putting in hours and hours and weeks of work, but it wasn't a listed property you had to begin with. So it is important to discuss commission in situations like that. And according to Aria, that's one of the things you bring up for buyers. I, I don't agree with that. Okay, and that's why I like to use their examples of the 4P because we can discuss and add things in there, okay? And these are things that are going through your head as a licensed salesperson when you're looking at the two sides of the main two sides of real estate and attaching them, associating them with the 4Ps. So the 4Ps, buying and selling. So it does say on the selling side, determine the listing price strategy. Okay, is the market super hot? And maybe there's a strategy to underprice it. And then you get so much interest, you end up getting like 30 offers. And that, that can be very dangerous. But one thing you guys should know, and a lot of people don't know this, you can price your house wherever you want. And somebody could come up and offer you asking price with, with nothing in the offer that makes you wait it out and conditions and stuff like that, all the stuff we're going to learn about. And you can say no. You can say no because you don't like it. There are no legal issues there, there's no rules, there's nothing that says you have to sell, there's no false advertising or anything like that. This is private property, people own this property. They can list it for sale, see what happens. Somebody might come in, totally fall in love with it and just decide they don't want it anymore. So you obviously want to avoid stuff like that when you're talking to sellers. You want to determine with them and sit down and strategize, what is the best way to get my sellers to a price that I know isn't gonna be that hard on me? I know that sounds like I'm, I'm trying to get out of more work, but you do not want to take the listings where people are insisting that they're gonna price it at a certain level that you know isn't going to work. Keep in mind that this whole lecture we're talking about today is about marketing and it's about traditional media and what to use and not to use. You could use any form of media when a listing is dramatically overpriced and it's, it's never even gonna show. It doesn't really matter. Okay, it just doesn't matter. So you have to be prepared to deal with that. Uh, determine the listing price strategy for optimal marketability. So that means list it within the market. Make sure other places are selling around it. Sold properties, expired listings. Look at all that stuff and look at the market trends. And that's where you're going to have to negotiate on commission. Okay, and this is from the Ontario uh, Real Estate Association. It says that you should be talking about commission to represent sellers and buyers. They do mention sellers, right? But if you're marketing your services and we're talking about price, it's not just the price of the home. It's the price you're gonna charge for what you're gonna do for these people. 95 to 98% of the time, I don't even know what the exact statistic is, but we, we don't see a whole lot of deals done on, we call them private sales when the property wasn't listed, where the realtor has negotiated for the buyer to pay commission. Almost, like it's in the high 90s. It, the, the realtor has found a place for the buyer and out of the selling price, which the seller has sold and they're going to get, comes the commission. Comes out, so the seller pays the commission. So when a seller lists a property, you're negotiating with them at that time to discuss what they're going to pay when it sells. Okay, that's what happens there. So it's a pretty big deal and you want to get through that. You want to have notes prepared. You want to have things ready to go. Okay. And then for place, they say determine methods to get the message out to target groups. That's a very good, super generic answer. Okay. That within the place that you're working. Okay. And it's pretty much the same answer on the other side for sellers too. The same exact answer. So, and this is how most realtors start. And I'm not saying anything is wrong with the stuff that Aria has put in these slides. I'm just saying that it's not that simple. It has to be more specific and you have to figure out what you want to do and it's okay to be focused. 
It's okay to be focused. They have to give generic answers because they have no idea what size town you're going to work in, which side you're going to be more focused on. It's not like I focus more on sellers and more on buyers. I, I focus probably more on residential, even though I do some commercial. But um, all very sort of generic answers. So uh, here's a different way to look at it, okay? Buyers that are out there, you're not going to get a ton of buyers, especially at the beginning. Usually you end up getting buyers through things you list that they don't end up buying. That's how I get most of my buyer leads. They look at something else. People don't just randomly come to me and say, I'm looking to buy something in Grand Bend. I heard you were the guy to help me out. They do, but I'm talking like out of every hundred leads, there might be two or three like that, maybe. Okay, so that means that if you, if you become a real estate salesperson and you think you're just gonna wait till all your friends and family buy houses and just represent them when they do, your business is never going to grow. You have to be out there trying to get listings. Okay, so buyers will be sold on your listings and then you'll get more buyers. Sellers need to be sold on you. That's the difference, okay? You don't be too hung up on how to make sure buyers are attracted to you. If your listings look like hot shit, the buyers are going to come look at them anyway. There's lots of buyers out there that hate realtors and think, I don't need a realtor, I don't need a realtor. And if your listing looks really good, even though they don't need a realtor as a buyer, they're still gonna to come to you as the realtor to look at that listing. They're also under the impression that they'll automatically get a better deal if only one realtor is involved because there's commission on both sides when you list a property, okay? There's commission on both sides. But if you sell it yourself as the listing salesperson, you can set it up so that the seller pays a little bit less commission instead of paying the same amount. That's more common now than the listing, let's say it's at 5%, right? The listing's at 5% and then if they sell it themselves, they get the whole 5%. That's pretty rare now. You might see that with like a business sale or some commercial stuff, but usually there's a bit of a discount. If they, it's called double ending. Okay, so in a situation like this, sellers need to understand that you're looking out for them. You're trying to get them the best deal you can on commission, which is about them paying for your services. So. If they want a 3% listing, which I do do, I will charge, I shouldn't even be putting this in the video, but I do it. I will charge, um, two. you always have to offer the other realtor 2%. It's almost like the standard thing in most communities across Ontario. Some of them are still stuck at 2.5%. But if you try and offer any less than that to a realtor that's found a buyer and they've been dragging them around for the better part of a year, they won't even show your listing. Okay, so you also have to think about the other realtors too and how you're gonna sit and pitch to them and sell to them. When you put, that's not what our focus is today. Our focus today is trying to understand where we should spend our time and of course money when it comes to tr traditional media in order to harvest in and bring in business. Because most of the stuff is a complete waste of money. So knowing that sellers are gonna need to be sold on you and it's, it's more about a personal connection than anything and at that point, you test them out. You see what they're willing to do for commission. You, you kind of test the water a little bit and you show them what you can offer for a full price commission. I got the video, I got professional aerial, professional photos, I got all this stuff. But if you want all that put in there, which does help the sale, I, I can prove to them it can. I have listings that have sold that way. Um, you're gonna have to pay me 5%. Okay, they, get, they gotta go full pop. And, if I, and I'm only offering 2% to the other realtor, I get three. Okay, so it, it's, I have to really show them something special to get those kind of rates today. Okay, so usually if they feel like just my personality and my name being on it and my involvement is gonna do enough, they say, no, you can take the pictures yourself and I do have a professional camera. You don't take smartphone photos, okay? That'll be in another week too. Then I go and I give them the discount package, but it's really, really important that you understand that what you're doing out there when you're, you're trying to gain traction you're trying to get your name out there, you still have to have listings, okay? If you don't have listings, you're gonna run out of buyers eventually. You just will. Okay, so uh, why does this matter and what's the mix? Like how am I, there is no right answer. Okay, there's no right answer for whether you focus more on buyers or whether you focus more on sellers. You are going to be a real estate salesperson. You are, and this is, so if you're in this course just to study commission sales, because I know when uh, 
when Greg asked that question last week, the guest speaker, like how many people in this course might be a realtor? Only about three or four people raised their hands. There aren't a lot of commission sales industries where you have like the two sides of things, where you're selling, you're helping people, facilitating sales and you're facilitating purchases. Okay, you don't see that a lot. So it does make it more complicated and you have to be on both sides. And that's why, well, I'll tell you why it really matters. It matters more because people assume that if they just advertise how cool they are, especially in traditional media, if they just say, I'm in this town and I'm selling real estate, that someone's gonna actually care. Nobody is gonna care at all, okay? That's why you need to understand, you need to be careful with this. If you advertise a really high profile listing, they still don't care whose name's on it. They might just care about the property. So it matters so that you know not to spend money on the things that won't work. The people that care that it's you selling real estate are already in your mix based on all the stuff we talked about last week with lead management and staying very close to the people that are closest to you, just keeping on top of that 20%. Okay, they're gonna be there as buyers and sellers no matter what. So whatever you're gonna spend on advertising isn't gonna be about the 20%. That's why, again, you need to be careful with it. You don't wanna to dump too much money into the 80%. So what's the mix? There is no proper mix, okay? There really isn't, okay? But there is a bit of direction I can give you. Your first two years, if you get into sales commission, and this is different than if you're doing pharmaceuticals or you're marketing your own business and it's a very specific thing, there's lots of other real estate salespeople out there, lots. So you need to make sure in your first two years, there, there is a bit of a, a mix to one side. Focus on your business, okay? Focus on your skills and knowledge. Focus on anything that makes you unique. You're focusing on you. Because your job at that point, you're, you're not gonna be able to get people that you sold something to two years ago to go and, and buy something else, and then you'll get the listing too, if you don't have any of that history yet in the industry. So you're starting off fresh. And in my first two years, I did have, I paid a lot more attention to my website I had a lot of cheesy ads that did nothing, by the way, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but print ads that just, they didn't have any listings in them. It was just talking about me and what I can do. I did direct mail like that. Um, when eventually what happened is I, I ended up staying close to that 20%. I got a lot of leads out of that that led to more business and more listings. The key is to get listings. Okay, you gotta have listings. It's huge. People think they're gonna survive with buyers and they're not. Once you do that for a couple years and you build up a client base, okay, yeah, and that's right, that last bullet there, you're gonna be able to go back to those people that worked with you and always be, not, not begging for business or anything like that, but you're gonna go back to them and ask for business, okay? So why am I going on and on about this? In a lecture, we're gonna be talking about traditional media because this, is the traditional marketing that I want you guys to be doing. This, and what am I really talking about? Direct communication, maybe a tiny bit of cold calling, but direct communication, word of mouth, staying in touch with people. It's just a continuation of what we talked about last week. Oh, I thought we were gonna come in here, Mike, and talk about how to do the best print ads and where the bleed is and how to get it done in photo. Oh my God, that crap is such a waste of time and money. And if you do end up needing to do a print ad because a client insists upon it, which does happen for sure, and we have those clients that we're willing to do that for, I have a bit of, uh, like I have some skills with, with graphic design, but if not, you'd probably be able to pay somebody a moderate amount of money to help you out with that. Or if you work for a good brokerage, they can set you up with that in their office. They can set up the ads for you. Don't get hung up on that stuff. It's all about people. So once you get those people in the hopper in the first two years, that's what you're doing. Focusing on getting more listings. Hey, you just bought this. I saw you did a lot of work to it. Are you planning on flipping it? Let's see what kind of money we can make. Or hey, you had two more kids since we last worked together. You, you must be grown out of that house, right? But you're very soft on this approach and you're just staying in touch with people. And the money you're spending on direct marketing is going to those people. It's going to the 20% that prove that they're willing to do business with you. If you do any sort of just standalone advertising and you've been in the business for two years now, you should focus on the things that you've accomplished. Focus on reputation, credibility, flexibility. Oh, I'll match anybody's rate. I do that, I grab that. 
I've regretted it a couple times, but I do it because my name being everywhere makes a big difference in the long run. So sometimes you, you, you go out willing to make less money just to increase your volume and get your name out there. Focus on your general experience that you've had, not just one-off things that you've done that have improved your reputation, but start blogging. Like If you're gonna spend money on advertising, I would blog first, even though not a lot of people might read it, just to send that article to somebody when it comes up, because it'll already be prepared. Well, here's an article I wrote on the dangers of overpricing. Okay, overpricing can be very dangerous because if you overprice, it can result in nothing happening within the first 30 days. And if you're in a city market like London, nothing happens in the first 30 days, it's a bad thing, okay? Right now, in a seller's market, it means it's overpriced automatically. And that means that people will go and look at how long it's been on the market, and they'll say, oh, well, I'm not giving them anything near that. It's been sitting there for a month already. Anything that's a good deal sells in a week. And they're right, okay? And then they end up getting less in the long run than they would have got if they just priced it where it should have been to begin with. They end up getting less money by overpricing it. I could write a book on it. Like, it, So if you had an article on that and you want to help somebody to get their head around this pricing issue, you can give them stuff like that. So you can give them experience-based literature, experience-based, well, I've worked with so-and-so and this is the testimonial they gave and they said I was okay to share this with other clients. Um, what, did you, what have you gotten really good at in those first two years? That's where you start focusing, right? So all of this stuff can be done without really spending any money. You can do it by spending time on things, but you don't necessarily have to spend money. So as we jump into this now, just bear in mind that my experience and guidance with all this stuff, it would apply to both sides, okay? Whether you're working with buyers and sellers, and it's based on me actually trying a lot of these traditional mediums and literally getting no response. So I'm not just coming out of left field like this. And you, you guys probably saw that in the course outline. You're like, oh, cool. We're going to learn about how to place a radio ad. And how to... There's nothing to learn about it. You just pay for it. Okay. And if you want to do your own radio ad, you go into the radio station, they stick you in a little booth and they give you 20 minutes. And if you take too long, they start charging you more money. Oh, you're doing too many takes, Mike. Well, it's got to be good. Come on. I've done radio advertising. I did it for a subdivision I was working on. I've done a lot of radio advertising, actually. I've done stuff for the band, too. I've done loads of print advertising. And a few years ago, I just stopped. I mean, it just wasn't doing anything. So let's talk about traditional marketing and what it is. Okay, so traditional marketing versus what we know about the stuff that we're, we're experiencing more and more today, it's one-way communication. We don't feel that engagement like we do online. Okay? We don't feel that engagement like we do in social platforms. We can't reach out there and touch it on the other end. It's gone. The second you decide you're gonna do traditional media, it's gone. I'm not saying to do none of it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is most of it, you're not getting much money for your, for your investment, okay? There's very little return on your investment, okay? You are reaching way more people. So way bigger audiences, okay? Way bigger audiences. When I do these targeted Facebook campaigns, I don't wanna reach thousands and thousands of people. I only want to reach the people that have specific content in their profiles that actually connects to what I'm trying to advertise. When I do a postcard campaign through mail, everybody that has an address in that mailing district is going to get it, whether you're interested in real estate or not, which means a lot of those are just going to be thrown right in the garbage, no matter what, right? So, well, then why do people still do it? Because sometimes it still works. And if you have the budget for it, that's okay. But I'm I'm of the argument you don't need to do it at all if you handle your business the right way. So it can be very costly with very little return. And here are some examples of all these things. Radio. I just talked about radio. I put it at the top because I've actually done a fair amount of radio. I've never done any TV. I can't afford it. Okay, but I have done radio advertising. I've done my own voiceovers. Sounded exciting, sounded cool. I even had like a, a you can add promotional campaigns to your paid advertising where if somebody hears the ad, you can tell them, come into my open house and tell me you heard this ad and I'll give you a free Timmy's card. That kind of stuff is great. In fact, that kind of stuff works really well, but all you have to do to get people to come out and get, pick up free crap is email. That's all you need to do. Putting it on the radio means that you're advertising to this massive audience 
99% of whom probably don't give a crap about your subdivision in Grand Bend, even though you are advertising on my FM near Grand Bend. It's just, it is what it is. Those, that free Tim's card thing works when I do open houses and I tell people they, they come out to get their free stuff. People love free stuff. But when I connected it to my radio ads thinking it was still gonna work, it didn't, okay? Emailing people actually works. Like TV, I haven't bothered with, it's super expensive. I would never use it as a realtor. Print ads, I've done tons of. Never once, ever, have I had anybody that actually did business with me tell me that they it was because they saw a print ad that I did, it, ever. And I've done probably close to 50 of them. Most realtors that have been in the business for over 10 years like me have done hundreds, but I was smart enough to stop the bleeding, all right? So no, I'm not here today to teach you how to do print ads. Signage and billboards, check. That stuff actually works. You wanna know why? Because while people have stopped picking up magazines, people are watching commercials less and less, People barely listen to the radio anymore, traditional radio, because they have sat radio and they have all these different forms of media. They're spending way more of all that time they piled together where they used to be on the traditional mediums on social media. They're all still driving around. They're all still out there in the world. That hasn't stopped. Maybe a little bit less so. There are a lot of arguments that millennials go out to the bar and see live music and do all those things less than the generation preceding them. I've seen live music go to places that I didn't think it would. It, it's just dying sort of in a way. And then, and then if you're not doing like beats and, you know, EMD and all this electronica stuff, it's like, it's not really music when that in fact is not really music. And I could go, I could go into a whole thing about how the music industry's changed as a result of social media, but I'm not going to, and I'm not criticizing my millennials at all. People make genres and they build markets just as a result of having this digital world. It's called participatory culture. That's another thing we get into next week. What we're talking about here is the stuff that's been going on literally for thousands of years. And it's not cheap because there's a lot of production costs in, involved in it. There's labor costs, there's back and forth, there's checking and, and then redoing and fixing and there's all this stuff. And if you're a realtor and you're not good with, uh, with graphics, you have to pay for a graphic designer. There's all these extra little costs and it's like, holy crap. I could have just sent an email to some people. Damn right, you could have. And I do email blasts. That's one of the things I do that I don't really talk about much today because I wanted to take this chunk that you have here that you can work with and tell you that there's nothing you need to bother with in there except signage. And then if you want to spend a little more money, you can do newsletters, which is my example of e emails, right? I do all that via email. It's pretty much free. You don't have to print them, okay? You can do it via email and you'll pretty much get the same rate, not pretty much. I don't have the actual data on this, but I know every time I printed stuff like that, it did nothing. And I actually do get responses from my emails. So there's, there's an example for you. Um, the data, I'm, gonna, I, I'm of course gonna show you some data today, but it's not specific to any of these mediums. Brochures, flyers. My band, when we used to play downtown at Call the Office, half the audience would be there because they saw flyers on telephone poles. And the rest of them would be there because they got an email from us. Okay, when we had big events and we were doing benefit shows, then we'd do radio advertising because the radio would give us free ad space because it was a benefit. All right, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a sneaky way to get out there even more. Uh, but it, we wouldn't have paid for it otherwise. We've only paid for radio advertising in real estate. Okay, here's some better examples of stuff I do in real estate. Signage. Signage, not just to show everyone that I'm selling that house, but signage for presents. Oh, I sold that house and I ran out of signs, so I went and picked it up. This happened to me this week. That is nonsense. I should not be picking up a sign that says sold on it until the day I have to pick that up because that is advertising. And to me, it's free advertising. Yeah, I had to pay for the sign, but I've reused it over and over again. It's already paid for itself. And when I sell a listing, I get to leave that up. I've run out of signs because all the drunk people, down, I, I got a lot of listings downtown this past summer. So downtown Grand Bend in the middle of the summer, I don't take it personally. And I see Will in the back there. I almost feel like you've got to one of my sides. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is because when I was younger and I was drunk after I got out of the bar, me and my buddies were way more into jumping into bushes. I, maybe it was a jackass thing, I don't know. And you don't get, you don't get vandalism tickets for that usually. 
Um, now the big thing is whatever signs people can find anywhere, like in front of a store, anywhere on the ground or whatever, I just get my signs ripped up. They'll be, the, the funny part is when they pull my signs up very carefully and they go put them on other people's houses. And then I'll get calls from these people that week. Sloan, listen, um, you're not selling my house. I don't even know you. I don't know why your sign's on my lawn. I'm like, oh, they did it again. Or they're just gone and thrown in the river and thrown in the lake. So I've run a little low on signs and I got busy and I haven't put my signs up, okay? And now I'm like, holy crap, I'm out of signs. So yesterday I went to a place, because I'm teaching right now. I'm not lo looking at that, right? I went to a place where I had a sold sign up that doesn't close for a month. And I took the sign from that place because it's the lowest traffic place I had listed that was sold to put it on a new listing because that guy needs a sign and I don't have time to go buy more signs. It's actually the frames I'm out of. I have more signs, I'm out of the frames, which is the more expensive part, the steel frame. And they whip them. And you can pay people to do your signs and stuff like that. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, I think it's better to do it yourself so you can keep better track of it. It doesn't take that much time. And, when the sellers see you there putting the sign up, they feel more connected to you, right? You don't want to send some company out to put the sign up. And I'm in Grand Bend, there's not a lot of people that do that. So, so signage is huge. And once you sell stuff, it's not just about having the sign up anymore because your job's already done, okay? You might help them transfer the utilities and help them with a bit of stuff like that, but the thing is done, it's over, it's sold. But you get to leave that up. That has done more for me than any print ad I have ever done. And I simply have those signs up by, if we go back a few slides, by focusing my business on people and not making sure that I'm exposed everywhere. It's, it's the, the whole thing that Gary Vee talked about in the video we watched, okay? It, just because all these platforms are there doesn't mean you have to be putting an equal amount in every freaking platform. You know what? If, if, if the 20% is where 80% of your business is coming from, then take 80% of your money and put it in there. Go hard on that. So signage is a big deal to me. So I make big, huge signs. Most realtors never pop for the big signs because it's like 70 bucks a sign. Screw that. And I want my, I have had so many comments from so many people. Oh my God, I see your name everywhere downtown. I see your name here. I see your name. How many comments have I had that people saw my print ads? And I've done a lot of them. Like a couple from like friends of mine that saw my ad for the Bonnie Dune Hotel, which is a lakefront hotel. They're like, I liked how it looked really different compared to all the rest of the ads. They still weren't buyers. Right, so that's the key for my business. I don't want to turn this course into how to be a realtor like Mike Sloan, but I've I've done quite well with the way I'm telling you. I could I could pick 30 realtors out of anywhere and bring them into this room right now and say, prove to me you've had ROI and all that print advertising. You will not stop doing, and they couldn't do it. They do it because their clients expect it, and they keep telling their clients, "You'll be part of our print ad, our monthly print ad." And it's got like a whole page with like 16 listings on it in these little tiny cubes. The print ads I've actually done, it's one listing on an entire page. Because otherwise, what's the point, right? But it's still not worth it, okay? So printing, I spent a thousand bucks on a print ad for a client recently in the KW magazine. I knew it would do nothing, and it was the slickest ad in that magazine. By far, it was awesome. It looked really good. It didn't do anything. Okay, you know how many signs I could buy for $1,000? They're like 17 bucks each for my regular ones, like 50 to 75 for the big ones I do. Could have bought more frames, but I didn't have, you know what, This I have a special relationship with this client. I was okay with it. I'm not now, but I was when I did it. <laughs> I'm not now because I haven't sold the place and I spent the thousand bucks, but it's just, I, I've probably got close to five grand in that listing but only a thousand of it was print. Maybe fifteen hundred actually, because I did some other stuff. Yes, question. Is it ever like is it bad to oppose against the client, like say for all these reasons why print ad is bad? Is that like, is that no, is that but you bad? have no, but you have to great question. But you have to give them the alternative that you do instead of print advertising. Yeah. Which is I have a I have a great network of people that are interested in properties like this. They're gonna know about it no matter what. They might not catch the listing. So that's that's number one for me. I also specialize in capturing people's attention in video format. And while Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and, and, and LinkedIn and a bunch of these different platforms, maybe not so much LinkedIn, but a lot less selling is going on on LinkedIn, they, they have 
been shown not to be super engaging for baby boomers. And a lot of my buyers in Grand Bend are into that. They're into their 60s and they're kind of looking to retire and they're, they're not Gen X. They're, they're, they're like the, the younger of the baby boomers. Um, they, they're totally all over YouTube. They love it. They just don't like Facebook and they don't like these other platforms. So it's, and I have research I can show them that shows that, that they're there. And, and, I can, and I say, listen, every penny I would have spent on a print ad, I'm gonna actually be talking to people and engaging with them on my video, and I'm gonna be spending time on my video. You, you wanna go with the realtor that just writes checks and doesn't do more work on your listing. My making that video means I will know your listing better than any other realtor would have. I'll be inside every corner. So there's all kinds of ways I can pitch it. And I say, that's where I spend my time and money. I wanna make sure that nobody misses anything with your listing. 99% of print ads, people are gonna miss every cool thing about it, and nobody looks at them anyway anymore. They're all online. They're, I, and now we're gonna go over some data that shows that. But the other thing is that I use is just general net networking. So an extension of week seven, what we talked about last week and what Greg talked about, of course, Greg has a drip, drip campaign, Greg has CRM, Greg is keeping in touch with people, most of which are probably already clients. But, and Greg's out there on social and he's paying somebody to do it every month, just like me. But that's not where most of our business is coming from. Most of our business is coming from the foundational clients we built up in that first two years when we were just pushing ourselves like crazy. And then you get busy enough with those people that you don't have time to keep pushing yourself like crazy. But that's where the money comes from. So just if you're still struggling to do that after two years, you're not networking enough. And guess what? Networking costs money too, because it takes time and time is money. But it's a lot better than money just burned up with print ads. Like, what do I mean by general networking? Because we talked about this, and this is traditional. That's a medium. I don't care what people say. Networking is a medium. Oh, no, it's not. Well, what's an advertising medium? It's a venue or a place or a location where you can convey your message. How come you can't do that in person? Word of mouth, okay? Face to face. Get out there, talk about it. You're not, it, it should always be on. You're not talking about real estate enough, okay? So it's, it's kind of like, same as the previous bullet, but not really, because networking could be a special event. You could be going to somewhere where people wouldn't expect to see a realtor, and like the home building show and you give your cards to every single contractor you met there, and all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, that's the guy in Grand Bend we should call. If you're working in the city market, it is a little harder because there's lots of people that do that in city markets, but hardly anyone does that in Grand Bend. Have I done that? No, but if my business sucked, I would. And I'd take students with me and I'd show them what to do. You know what I mean? Like it's, that's the stuff that works. All this stuff up here in the general medium examples, waste of money, okay? Unless you're emailing the newsletters. The brochures, the flyers, put it, that's all for mailing because you can't, you can't really go flyering it. There are examples of stuff, okay, in a local community where you could go down and flyer cars on a busy day at the beach. You might get a call from that. You're more likely to than a print ad, but my primary focus is making sure people see my name everywhere by spending the least amount of money I can on it and just keeping in touch with people all the time, general word of mouth, networking, that kind of stuff. Okay, your business is always on, remember that. It's never off. Open houses are another good way if, if you're still failing to get that traction. I'm in a small town, I don't like open houses because it's nothing but all the nosy neighbors just going and seeing what's going on. Open houses in the city markets, especially when you're in a good seller's market, you will get leads out of that. You will meet people face to face and you will get offers all the time to run open houses for other realtors and if you get a lead from their open house, it's freaking yours. You're the one who went there. They might insist on a referral fee, but how they, well, not how they're gonna know. I'm pretty honest and upfront about that stuff. I would never ask somebody for a referral if they were willing to do an open house for me. So if you're working within the same brokerage with a bunch of other realtors, they could come sit in. Realtors that have a slow business, I would be doing every open house I could get my hands on. I don't do any now because I don't, I have enough business that I, barely have time for it, but that's because I have two jobs. Okay, as soon as I were to choose to do only real estate, which I never will, because I love teaching and I don't love real estate. I love making money, but I don't love real estate because I, for, for that one client that made your month, 
so awesome, even if you only made a, you know, like a thousand bucks with them or something like that, but it was actually enjoyable and fun. Most other clients are very hard on you, right? Especially if you're nice and you let them be that way, which I do because I want them to come back. It's tough. They call you whenever they want. They ask for things that are hard to get. And I have a guy today, I'm going to see a place for him, sight unseen, because I trust that he will actually do this. On my way home, I'm going to look at it. He's going to make an offer if I tell him to. It's very hard to find clients like that. But he came into Grand Bend. My name was everywhere. He figured this guy's got to know what he's talking about. Okay, but he calls me nonstop and asks me to do stuff that's really annoying. So I figured if he's going to ask me to do this, which might lead to an offer, I'll actually do it. It's, I do that instead of open houses. I do stuff like that. But open houses... I would still do before I'd ever place a radio or print ad or anything to advertise, hey, look, I'm in real estate. But you have to remember too, I, as I led into this traditional marketing podcast or lecture, whatever you want to call it, it's mostly a podcast, I was talking about people on the buying side, people on the selling side, and how you're going to have to cater to both. I'm not really talking about just going out there like crazy and advertising that you're in real estate. That's done directly with people. Those ads don't get you much traction. So until you get a lot of listings, I wouldn't really spend that much money on paid advertising at all. Just keep working with the people, okay? You need listings to start spending money on that. And it's really just to keep your sellers happy because at the end of the day, having your stuff on realtor.ca is like, you're, just by default, it's gonna have exposure to all the buyers. You just wanna get as much of that business as you can. Um, so. Why is digital different than what we've been talking about here? Okay, and that'll be to, con uh, to be continued in week nine. Digital is constantly changing. It's really difficult to know where to be spending your money when it's changing that often, but at least you're not spending as much. You get a little more bang for your buck versus a stagnant and shrinking print market, which is for sure the case. Okay, web 2.0. We will talk more about that next week. That is. That is where the, the World Wide Web, which is the main platform still that we are using via the internet to exchange information, where it, it turned in and became a collaborative community instead of just a big giant brochure for everyone's stuff. People started participating. People were engaged. People, you probably talked about that in your marketing course. The evolution of Web 2.0. That changed marketing across the board. Print ads. And, and print advertisers are attempting to be more engaging as a result of what happened on the web. But it's just not working, okay? So you're directly engaging with people on the web in digital versus one-way communication. You can micro-target the way I've talked about, okay? And that, that makes it, you know, more of an experience. It's personal. You're, you're connecting with these people directly. I had an app on my website when business was a bit slower where I was... I'd sit there and watch when traffic would come on my website. I had, I had somebody else that would do it for me too when I'd be busy, but it would send me a text message whenever there was direct traffic on my website and tell me where these people were and how long they were there for. It was a free WordPress plugin, free. And then I'd go start talking to them. Hey, I see you've been looking at this listing in Park Hill for like five minutes. You want me to find out some more stuff for you? Wouldn't you be my listing, right? Because you can, you can run other realtors' listings through your website through plugins. I talked about that too with the IDX costs and stuff like that. So there, there are expenses associated with this that I consider advertising expenses, but it works. And you're, you could never do that with a print ad. You can't, I mean, the technology is probably coming, but as of today, you can't have somebody open up a magazine and the second they get to your page, it calls your cell phone and you come up on a video call. It's actually a pretty cool idea. That'd be a sweet magazine where you could just press a button on a print ad where somebody's advertising for something and it would call their phone, you'd go into a video call with them and you'd be like, hey buddy, tell me more about this print ad I'm looking at, because this doesn't tell me shit. Because that's what print ads do, they don't, print ads are a lot about like psychological reflex and emotion and angles and trying to get your focus to a certain brand. So when you go into a retail store, your attention is drawn to that brand. I don't think it works that well for real estate. A lot of people's real estate print ads are all pictures of them. It's like. If I'm looking in a real estate magazine, I don't care what you look like. I just want to look at the property. I want to look at the house. It's, it's very hard to engage people with a, a virtual tour in a print ad. So it's very different. Um, and it can be more affordable. 
uh, with similar return. I'm not saying you get a big return from this advertising either. Paid advertising generates very little return for you in commission sales. Greg is beyond what I've seen in terms of harvesting and dealing with leads. And you heard it from him. He, he doesn't even, he's focusing 99%, not 80, 20, like almost 100% on these people that are, have done business with him that he knows, people he knows. Okay, so we'll get more into the digital space next week because you're not gonna write that off. You're gonna have to be digitally advertising basically to show your clients, your listing clients that you can do it. Okay, but this tells the story. Okay, and this is here, 2009, okay, 2019. So here's a decade. In 2009, and remember 2009, we already thought YouTube was the shit. Like, holy crap, YouTube. It, that's when everybody really started hitting YouTube. If you look at a lot of the biggest musical artists, uh, most of the stuff that was released before 2009, it all transferred over in 2009. You look at the dates. That was a big year for digital media, a big year. But there was a lot of apprehension still, and a lot of the old school marketers, they didn't want to touch it yet. So digital was down here, 17%. This is paid marketing. There are people probably were still generating content, but. Allegedly, this article, and I link to it in there, I'm sourcing this from Visual Capitalist. This is basing that on money they'd spent on it too. So not just the, the fees you pay for the advertising, but to develop the media itself and put it in there and all that stuff. 17%, newspapers, 22%. Newspapers are still fairly strong given how much stuff has changed. It's pretty interesting, but TV, TV seems to still be a, a lasting power because I think the type of people that advertise on TV, they're way beyond the kind of advertising you do as an entrepreneur. Like way, way beyond that. These are big, huge brands that are advertising to maintain brand recognition. So that's another thing you have to consider is what is the point of your paid advertising? Because as a real estate salesperson, well, personal branding is important. You want to think about personal branding Okay, it's important. You're, you're not in the business of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on ads just so people know that you're the king realtor in a certain area. Okay, that's not because your target market's different. Not everyone is looking to buy and sell real estate all the time. Most of the population is looking to drink Bud or Bud Light for some reason. I don't understand that. but. It's, it, you see what I'm saying, it's your mass market advertising is still dominant in television. But this is the one that I think is cool, other. So this is just generally speaking, other means like direct mail. So that, that held itself pretty strong too. But let's, let's consider this newspaper area, print media. So it's been cut in half, literally cut in half. And where TV used to dominate, it no longer does, it's now digital. This is where the money's being spent in 2019, in 10 years. That's a fast change. I mean, that, that, that's a fast evolution, that's quick. Usually it takes longer than that for things to change that much. Okay, so this is just for your consideration. I'm not gonna be, well, I might ask you some general questions about that on the test, but look at this. Okay, you wanna talk about dollars and cents. Okay, look at the blue line. Percent of total media and spending is just gonna keep going up. It's always going up. It's just where the money's going, okay? And the change is sort of going down almost like at the same time as a cycle where you can't get away from spending money. SEO, search engine optimization, you used to be able to do quite a bit for free. And now if you're not paying money, it's not even organic anymore. It's like it's totally pay to play. So generally speaking, the money people are spending on advertising is going up. Is this specific to real estate? No. But I guarantee overall, more realtors are realizing they have to have a prominent message out there, a prominent placement for big listings, and they gotta make sure that these clients are represented properly when they get the, this is why Every, everybody's doing it, so to speak. If everybody's doing it, you gotta do it too. But where are they doing it? Digital, okay? It's going up to the moon as far as I'm concerned, okay? So, this is taken from a magazine where I have, I have seen other stuff that I've liked. I've tried to find you guys the most current stuff. Um, biggest drawbacks, okay? 
You have zero interaction with your audience, little to none. You have none. How the hell do you know what they're doing? You're never going to see it. The money's gone. The ad is out there. It's never worked for me in real estate. I doubt it will for anybody else. I, the stories that people can tell you when it has worked, they got to be so few and far between compared to the amount of engagement I've had with, with digital marketing. I, I just can't even understand why people are still doing it. I, I, it blows my mind. Um, it's costly, okay? It, tough to measure ROI? It's like almost impossible. Every print ad I have always has some cheesy little thing in there like, tell them like Sloan, you saw this print ad and when you book your first show and you'll get a look. Like this one high-end listing I had, I had like gift packages ready to go. Like with a wine, a bottle of wine, like some food stuff, like there's all, like nobody, it just went to my clients because it doesn't work. Okay, if I put that as an Instagram campaign, I'd probably have to give out like 10 of those. That's why I don't do that on Instagram. You gotta be careful, right? Don't give away too much free stuff. Social media is all over that. Um, difficult to receive feedback. Again, impossible. Like what? I don't even know where this 5% is coming from. Pretty much I would say 50% costly, 25% or 50% no audience interaction, 25% costly, 25% nobody knows what the hell you're talking about. Because it, it's, it's just, this is accurate. And, but I'm specific to real estate where this is just general marketing. So that's the reason I wanted to show you those charts. All three of the charts I just showed you, those are not specific to real estate. This is happening across all industries, okay? Now, what matters for me? Obviously, you already know this based on what I've told you. Signage, signage leads to presence. People are talking about it. You're talking about it. This is kind of like a, almost like, you get the word of mouth for sure for people you've treated well and I get referrals and stuff like that. It's great. But the signage alone generates word of mouth. Okay. So let's pull that up here. Okay. General networking. Again, you're always on what I was talking about from week seven. Okay. And open houses as well. This is the only stuff that I care about, okay? Maybe a bit of direct marketing, community advertising. I do a generic real estate ad in Chamber of Commerce magazine because that's the direction of that magazine. People will be looking at that because they're exploring the area and they're exploring the community. And I put an ad in there showcasing the type of realtor I am. I know the beach, look at me kiteboarding, it's totally different than all the other realtor ads. They're just pictures of people in front of a house. That's not what I showed. So I do a little bit of that, but I still haven't had, ever had anyone tell me. I've had lots of friends say, I saw you in the Chamber Magazine. Nobody's ever called me and said, I saw your ad in the Chamber Magazine. I thought I'd call you up about real estate. I almost do it because, not almost, I do. I do it because then the community knows that I'm putting money into that. It's not a cheap ad. And it makes me look good in their eye. It's it's. It's one of those things you want to do in the community that sort of, that, that'll generate word of mouth, the fact that I even did that. Okay, but what matters most is that thing back at the top. So I can do all this other little stuff, but in terms of traditional media, the only thing I really give a hoot about is signage. Signs, signs, signs. I, I, go, I went through that whole first hour just to get to that to teach you guys that none of this stuff is really worth it when you see the data pushing you toward digital. Nobody cares about print media anymore. God, that guy said it in Ghostbusters in the 80s, which I thought was always a funny line when, when Egon says, um, print is dead. And it's just, it's funny that he said that in, in the mid 80s when print was pretty much dead the second the World Wide Web came around. I mean, look at how we buy books now. A lot of people love to have that book in their hand, and that's still very cool. That's not about advertising, but man, Kindle is just awesome. You just book after book after book, and it's a little thing you put in your pocket. You can do the same thing with your smartphone, but the Kindle has that effect on the screen where it makes it easier to read. Um, so what matters most to me is that. Okay, that's where all my business comes from in terms of traditional media. Traditional media to me is networking. It is talking to people. It is people talking about me. And the easiest way to do that is to get in front of their faces everywhere, everywhere you can. So if I was in a city market and I wanted to do that, there's a lot of realtors that swear by bus stop signage, right? It's not cheap. That's expensive stuff. You see it all the time. You know, on the bench, 
and inside the bus stops, there's advertising in there. They would do that before they they put their stuff in a magazine. But can you do that for a listing? Right, and the listing might be sold like pretty fast, right? I mean, I, I don't know. I've never done any of that, but I do have signage in other places outside of just my listings. Okay, so that's that's something we can talk about too. So signage is my largest traditional expense for sure. I spend, and when I say traditional, I mean I spend on advertising in a year. I'll spend maybe ten thousand dollars, maybe twelve. It's a fair amount of money, but most of that is paying my social media guy and paying my professional photographer. These are things I consider advertising expenses, right? And then paying for campaigns, like about a third of that is, is, is not labor costs. A third of that is, well, more than a third, probably more than half, is paying for the campaigns in Facebook and Instagram. Like I'm paying to have my stuff prominent and I need it to look that way for sellers, whether it works or not, because that's what they're looking at. But signage, in terms of traditional, is really the only thing I spend money on now. This year will be a bit different because I got talked into some print ads. But generally speaking, I might pop five to 600 bucks a year on signage because I do run a lot of signs and I lose a lot of signs. And that's like nothing, that's a nothing expense. That's how much I pay per month for my social media. Okay, so that is impressive return considering the signs are all, I get a lot of calls directly from listings, from people that saw the sign. That happens to me all the time. I've never had a call from a print ad, ever. That should have been, that should have been at the top of my lecture. Um, calls from signs, I gotta make a note about that. So it's that, I, I'm sure I'm gonna put that on the test because that's, and, and every realtor will tell you the same thing. Do you ever get phone calls from any of your tr traditional media? Signs, that's it, signs. And that's why it blows my mind that all these licensed salespeople will not put their direct phone number, their cell number on their sign. It drives me freaking crazy. They put the office number on there and then you have to call the office and the office pages you and then they might get back to you within an hour or two. I put my cell phone right on the sign. I don't put any other number on there. Most realtors don't do that. So I'm a little bit different. Um, and I have signs often, I've had signs before where it's just like my name and my phone number and Grand Bend Real Estate that local businesses have allowed me to like put up on the sides of their buildings downtown just for the summer and just put around. I had some friends that allowed me to do that before I had signs all over town. So then my signs were already, they were all over town even though I didn't have a lot of listings. And once I got the listings, now people are so used to seeing my name that if someone were to ask them, who comes right to your mind when you think of Grand Bend Real Estate, you're probably gonna say my name. And I've been doing it for less time than most of the people in that town. Because my signs, I managed to get my signs everywhere. It is such a big deal and it's the only thing I'm willing to spend time and money on. Time too, because I put up all my own signs and they gotta be straight and they gotta look good. You gotta take that stuff seriously. So simplicity is good. When you're gonna do signage, don't jam pack it full like pictures of yourself and pictures of other stuff and too much information, keep it simple, okay? Your name and your phone number should be the two biggest things on this sign. Should be huge. The fact that people don't get this still, I don't understand it. And I learned that from SEO. Because SEO, one of the most common things you can get for feedback on a website, because especially for small business and entrepreneurs, people are just on your website to find out how to call you. Or they're just on your website to find out how to get there. And if you don't make that really easy to find or put it right up front, they're just filtering through a bunch of crap to get to the simple information they want. So you don't want to do that with your signs, especially. Okay, go big or go home. I, I have my standard real estate signs with my name really big and my phone number really big. And any listing I can do it on, I put a bigger sign on it. Why the hell not? There's nothing illegal about it, unless you're on the road allowance. We're going to talk about that in a second. So you got to be careful with where you put them. But remember, this is... I just can't believe that people don't recognize when they're in real estate how valuable it is to have your sign on that person's property and the fact that these sellers want your sign on that property the second it lists most of them. I do have sellers that are very private that ask that the sign not go up and I have to respect those wishes and I always do. And I can tell that I get less 
direct phone calls about it when the sign isn't up. Because people that are interested in real property in a certain area, like I said half an hour ago, whenever that was, they might not be reading magazines anymore. They might not be reading newspapers. They might not be watching TV and listening to traditional radio, but they're still driving around looking at stuff. They're always doing that all the time. So that's why you want to be there. Now, the Real Estate Council of Ontario does require certain things to be on the sign. You have to have the name of your real estate brokerage in full so that people know that you are licensed with the real estate brokerage. Okay, they do have certain required things, okay? So the name of your real estate brokerage has to be on there, your full name, some sort of, well, they don't actually require a phone number. It should say your full name, it should provide some sort of direction for what the sign is for, and it should have the name of the brokerage on there, okay? It doesn't say how big that name has to be. It just has to be legible. So you do have some minor requirements. The sign should not be misleading in any way. There shouldn't be anything derogatory, but they don't tell you you have to put a picture of your face on there. I don't know why everybody does that. Okay, I don't care if people know what I look like. I just want them to be able to get to me. Okay, that's the biggest thing. So you do have to put some other stuff on there. You have to be careful when you're putting signs up everywhere. You can still put signs wherever the hell you want, okay? especially when you're in a neighborhood with very tight streets and the sidewalks close to the lawn and all that stuff, typically you should not be putting the sign on the road allowance. So the municipal road is for the city and the municipality to deal with. So the sign needs to be on the private property. There are cases where I get away with having a sign on the road allowance, like on the highway, where I have a sign pointing a directional sign to where my other signs are going. Okay, even my directional signs have this big, huge arrow, my name is huge, and my phone number's on there. Because what if they can't find where I'm going? Like, that's or where I'm leading them, I should say. So there are some things to be careful with because you do want to spend money on these signs and make them look good, and then you don't want to be losing every single one you put up because you put them in the wrong place and the town keeps taking them up and destroying them. I've lost a few signs that way too, back in the early days when I wasn't paying attention. Okay, so let's have some fun with this. Um, and then we'll wrap up. Let's discuss, because I'm making, I, I let this whole lecture was to lead you up to how important it is to have good signage. And I mean clear, concise, what is this, what's going on? Don't worry if they don't know your name yet. Just get as many signs out there as you can, okay? If you sell your own house, you stick a sign on it. You put a sold sign on it. Okay, I should have had a sold sign on the lot that I bought, um, because once I buy it, I can put the sold sign on it, and I was the one who brought them the deal privately, so, and I never did, right? But it, it was in Huron Woods, and everybody in there is a little older, and I didn't want to be too flashy. My house is flashy enough. Um, so, based on the little bit I've told you about signs so far, and you're about to learn a lot more, what's wrong with the first one in the top left corner? There's no name, no phone number. Oh wait, there is a there okay, hang on, wait a minute. Look at wait a minute. Tiny. There is a phone number right there to Australia, so it's shorter. That, that is the like you it's pretty easy to miss. Um somebody's tagged it in the corner, which is um I just I don't even know who this person is. Now, there's some suggestive stuff in this in this uh ad actually that's I don't know if she would have been that smart in terms of reactions to advertising where her eyeballs say I know you and then her eyes are I don't I, whatever it's crap to me I, I'm using it as a bad example okay there's no phone number there's nothing there her her picture takes up half the sign if you want to do something specific to a listing put a picture of that on there put a picture of the inside of the unit on there I don't usually do that I just make sure people can get a hold of me um, the one on the right is just for fun. I mean, for sale by owner signs are always crappy. They never, you know, if you want to get a for sale by owner sign, the biggest thing you got to have on there is your freaking phone number. And of course they don't have it, but you got to be careful with the kind of stuff you put on signs. And we'll get more into that in a minute. Um, it's lost job, can't pay, wife left, took dog, house, uh, house is a gem except for the asbestos. Like, holy cow, why would you ever use probably the main interaction that anybody's gonna have with this real estate listing 
to tell them that there's something wrong, that there's a material defect with the house. Like, you legally have to tell them that. But you don't have to put it on the sign. Like, once you engage, well, yeah, it's got some asbestos around the pipes, but it's really easy to mitigate. I got a contact for you. They can do it pretty cheap. And if you make me a good offer, I'll take care of it for you ahead of time and give you all the paperwork. But I would never put it on the sign. But they don't know any better for sale by owners, right? And there's no phone number. There's no website. There's no email. There's no way to contact them. I don't know if this is a joke or what, but the one down here in the left corner, um, and it looks a bit old. Well, I think it looks a bit older, but the... It's got a QR code on it, so it can't be that old. I mean, because that guy looks like he came out of Anchorman. Like the guy, like it's, but, but I can't figure out if he actually has a partner or if his partner is like a, yeah, like if he's a ventriloquist. Like I, and I'm like, what is this? Voted eight best real estate team. Okay, well, really? Okay, so maybe Ken is there and Chuck just wasn't there for the photo, so they put a dummy in. I wouldn't take anything like that seriously. Not because the guy looks like Anchorman, he came out of Anchorman, but because he says they're a team, he's got a dummy in there. There's no phone number. There's no name of the brokerage. There's nothing like this. That that should be an illegal sign if he's a licensed realtor, but it's just, it's just an example of, yeah, and I think if I pull that up, I don't think there's a phone number there. No, there's definitely not. There's no phone number, there's nothing. Like you can see, here, look. See, that's the whole sign. Twice the experience, <laughs> twice the experience and expertise. And they've got a hashtag there, Ken and Chuck. Clearly this is not some old real estate sign. The guy's just his style's a bit in the seventies, but the dummy and, okay, wait a minute. So what's your phone number? Where are you? Like, where are you located? What's the name of the brokerage? You, you, you get nothing except the QR code, but that's not legal to just have it in the QR code. Nobody uses QR codes anymore anyway. Um, well, yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, okay, uh, let's look at some more. You guys tell me, the one on the left, what's wrong with that one? Okay, and my online students, you can kind of just pause the video and take a look and decide what you think. The one on the, that takes up the left side of the slide, it's, it's not too bad. I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you a few things about signs right now, though. Yes? So it sounds like she's proposing a romantic affair. Huh. I didn't even think of that with that fall. That's called a rider. These different parts of the sign that have little things on them. But like to the north, to the average customer. Yeah, it's a bit weird. Um, she's she's listed a house. She's trying to sell a house, and on top of it, it says "fall in love." It's like a it's like real estate to dating game or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that's wrong for sure. The logo is like huge compared to her name. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any of the important stuff is like super tiny. And her name isn't even on the main sign. So signs that are attached like this, and I learned this the hard way by losing so many signs. When I first worked for Prudential, we had these fancy post signs. And they would always blow off and get ripped off and they'd be all over the neighborhood just constantly. So then I got these fixed sign frame signs where I can zip tie the crap out of them inside of a fixed metal frame and I never lose signs anymore. So what's likely to happen is she'll lose the bottom part before the bigger part falls off. Cause you can see those, those are steel hooks. Those just look like zip ties. That'll rip off. And then nobody will even know who the realtor is. She's got it separated on a separate sign. It's not something she probably thought of, but put all your stuff on one thing, like, and make it a little bigger, like, holy crap. Okay. Um, so what about this one here? That's not bad. I never like the pictures on the signs. I just think they take up space. Leaving a little bit of white space is good. It makes people feel less busy with it. But what don't I like about that? It's busy. It is busy. And it's busy because she stuck her stupid area code. Who reads numbers up and down? I know it's a little tiny thing, but it drives me nuts. Like, lay it out better. It's a, it's a crappy layout. That's why I don't like that sign. It's a crappy layout. And the one below, like, holy shit. I mean, come on. Hey, we changed our phone number, but we're not going to spend, you know, those are small signs. Those are probably 10 bucks US each day. Yeah, so he's got a new phone number. What, like what the, I don't, I don't know, I don't even know. You shouldn't have to look at a sign and have to figure out what's going on. I think the one is like the office number and the other one is personal maybe? Yeah, like it's, I knew you guys had a little fun with this. So that, like that's what I mean, like this is, 
This is the, I'm telling you right now, as a professional real estate salesperson, signage is the only thing you really need to be really hung up on and word of mouth and networking, which is still traditional media to me when it comes to traditional marketing. And look at how bad this is. It's so, look at this, what the, like look at that. And this is a different phone number. Well, which number should I call? Like which number? I don't know. So I'm, I'm looking at the one on the left now because it's, it's like here's a phone number, here's a phone number, here's a phone number, here's a phone number. Why don't you just give me one freaking phone number? And what's the area code? Who knows? And this is not an old sign because he's got the he's got the required logo up there. That's everybody has to have an area code now. Okay, um, this one in the left. There's a huge thing missing for this. If this is going to be stuck on a property that someone has listed, what's missing? Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, actually, yeah. even better. His name, her name, whoever it is. How about the words for sale? That every single for sale sign, same thing, same problem I have here, although that's not the reason I put that one in there. You don't know, listen, when I was building my house, I had signs all over my property. And they were signs to indicate who had participated in the design and construction of my house. And it's clear because the house is being built, right? So my architect, Brad Skinner, he had this nice slick looking black sign that stayed on my property until the house was done, okay? And it said, Skinner Architects, right? And you knew, it, these at least indicate that there's real estate happening here. And most people would decipher by seeing the sign that it was for sale, okay? But put it on there. Um, this is just, I don't understand, and that is an actual sign. Like it's so attention grabbing and we're gonna make everybody look at this sign and then we're gonna give them no information about how to get a hold of us. And it's real estate related. Hey, we buy houses. There's a lot of companies that do this. There's all these REITs that scoop up all these houses and they, they take houses from people who are uh, defaulted on their mortgage. And that and usually the same type of owner who defaults on their mortgage has run their house into the ground too. Go figure, what a coincidence. So people come along that have the capital to buy that back just based on what they have left on their mortgage to get them out from under the position they've gotten themselves into and they fix it up and resell it. There's lots of companies that do this, especially in the States, but you might wanna get a hold of them and there's no phone number, right? So, sorry, I never went to the next slide. So these are the ones I've been talking about here. Um, no for sale, no for sale, the one with no phone number. And then this guy here, I don't even know what to think of that. It looks, that looks like a drop your old car here junkyard sign in the right corner there. Like it just, there's no design elements to it. It's just really crappy. Okay. And, and the fact that his name is Dick Wrestler, you know, that's really the funny part about it. But I, that's not why I put it in. I noticed that one when I was searching crappy real estate signs and I'm like, okay, look at that sign. His stuff goes right to the edge. It's almost cut off. Um, it's just, when you have something that looks crappy, it's gonna make people think that you're crappy at your job. It, that's what psychology does to humans, it, it, it's that way. And then when you have riders, and you're allowed to use riders, and Rico doesn't have a problem with that, the real estate council, but don't put stuff in there like that. Reduced, but not stupid or desperate. Okay, like, it's just like, what? I would, I would, as soon as I see a sign like that, I will want to give them the lowest offer anybody would ever think of giving them just to piss them off because the sign says that. It's like asking for trouble. So don't, yeah, don't put stuff that's going to stir up emotions with people, right? Okay, uh, what is wrong with this? Definitely something wrong here, and you guys tell me, and I, I know a lot about waterfront property. I've dealt with a lot of it and I've seen a lot of stuff happening over the past couple of years. Water levels and stuff. What's happening here? <laughs> yeah. It's, hey, look at this riverfront property where clearly we have flood problems. I would have maybe found a higher piece of ground to put the sign on. I just, obviously the sign was put onto grass or something because they wouldn't have put it in the water. But you can even see in the background the house is like underwater. Like, I just think it's awesome. Uh, 20 flat acres. Hmm. So if this is full of water. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's an ad for a real estate agent, but it says in the quota, sell your house, pay yourself. 
Oh yeah, that yeah yeah that that's his that's his slogan. I, actually, that's pretty bad. I don't even understand that. Yeah, sell your house, pay yourself. That's weird. Of course, you're gonna get the money. It's your house. Yeah. You just yeah. Good point. I don't. That, now I like that he put the MLS number on there. I like signs with more information. I often do riders that give specific uh, domains, like little websites where I have something set up specific for a listing and I'll pay just to get that sign made just for that listing. So I'll do a rider, like something that looks like, um, like this here, where it says reduced. I'll do one that has a little website where people can go and my phone number's all huge right at the top of that too. And it shows the video and stuff. Um, so, but this is just, it's a really bad place to put a riverfront property sign when they know the river probably floods, like every spring or fall or something like that. So just no good. So this, this is what my signage looks like, okay? And I do consider stuff across the top of a website or a social platform signage. I'm not that opposed to using my picture. I just think when somebody's driving by a place and they might need to take down information quickly, your picture is just wasting space and wasting time. On the web, I definitely show my picture. I want people to, see that I'm a younger guy. I'm not, you know, I'm going to be more, because in there I put um, expert multimedia skills, right? So I, I'm, I have this special digital edge to me that I feel nobody else has, and I want to, I want to flaunt that. Um, and I'm a marketing professor, and I like to put all that stuff. To, so that's just a banner ad for where I would be. But my for sale signs don't say that. My for sale signs just make it really mindless for people to get in touch with me. Just, you cannot make it any easier. And it looks different than every one of those signs I showed you. Because I learned the hard way making stupid signs and seeing other people's signs that weren't working, what I should have on there. So my lecture on traditional media is make good signs. Spend money on signs. Put your signs everywhere anybody's willing to let you put them. If it's just a sign that advertises you as a realtor, you take that part up there that says for sale and put uh, Grand Bend Real Estate. Grand Bend, you, you can't put stuff though, when I talked about uh, rules and regulations, you can't put like the best or expert or award winning. Because if you do, you have to put a little asterisk down underneath it and explain why you're the best. You have to basically prove it. Those are advertising guidelines we get from the Real Estate Council. But I don't have to prove anything here. And I could, put, I could just put Grand Bend Realtor. Grand Bend specialist. That I shouldn't have to prove because I live in Grand Bend. Okay? So that's an example of what I do as opposed to the stuff you just saw. Um, okay, so, but what about all this stuff? Should I not do anything with it? If you're struggling with your business, the only thing I would revert back to is maybe some flyers and newsletters, maybe some direct mail, reaching out directly to people in the community, people you've worked with before, those kind of people. I still would never go back to the top and do anything up there. It's a waste of money. Yet, so many realtors in my industry swear by magazine print ads. And these magazines are making a killing doing nothing. They're basically just printing up a bunch of stuff that they can go and find at realtor.ca. So you have to have it on realtor.ca. That is huge, huge, huge. And when we get into our digital discussion next week, that's just gonna be the given thing. That's just gonna be the automatic thing. But remember the 80-20 rule, that 80% of your income is coming from 20% of your leads, 20% of the people you know, all those people. If you're struggling, go back to them, check in with them, talk to them. That's traditional advertising too. Okay, so I do provide you with an example. If you go to Homes and Land, and I'm not gonna do it in the video, you can go there yourself and look at the magazine, and it's just a bunch of little boxes with a bunch of houses in them and print you can barely read. It's a waste of money, okay? And if, if I open up a Homes and Land, I see some giant sign on a page, that might intrigue me. That's how I try and do my print ads if I ever have to do them. Okay, so at the end of the day, if you don't want to waste money on traditional media, be better at your job, okay? Provide better service. Stay close to your 20%. And no matter what, be very, very careful with traditional advertising. You are going to lose money, okay? This video is one I'd like you to watch in your spare time whenever you can. I will put a couple questions on it on the test. 
This guy, this, this is a video about marketing and real estate and there isn't one thing in the video that gets into like spending money on traditional advertising. And it's really well liked and it's a couple years old at this point. It's all about appointments. It's, it's funny, it, it's just meeting people. It's all that matters. So I like signage too. I like my things, but uh, I hope you guys learned today that whatever sales commission career you get into, wherever you're going, do not burn money on these traditional mediums, okay? It's, it's not gonna be worth it. Okay, and then next week we're gonna do, uh, next class I should say, not next week, uh, writing, and I'll have a quick exercise on that. So I'll see you guys on Wednesday, online students, just watch for my next video. Thank you for being here, thank you for listening.